Good morning, everyone. Has everyone gotten their coffee already? Yeah? Maybe not yet. Everyone's still like a little bit tired, huh? Well, I want to welcome all of you to the 2013 New Now Next International Media Conference. Uh, I'm really, really excited that all of you are here. Uh, we have a record turnout uh, for this whole entire weekend. All told, including panelists and all attendees here, we have uh, more than 250 people. This is more than double what we had last year, so we're all very, very excited. Um, first off, I want to introduce myself. My name is Ramey Innocencio. I'm the co-chair of this year's N3 conference, in addition to my other co-chair right here, Wendy Tang, if you could just uh, stand up and give her a round. Uh, I myself am the head of the AAJA uh, sub-chapter here in Hong Kong, uh, the vice president, but we have a, a, a huge AAJ network and family across Asia, uh, nearing about 200 people. Um, also, AAJ itself, if you don't know, has about 1,600 members across the United States, as well as here in Asia. It's the uh, country's largest nonprofit group uh, advocating for diversity in uh, workrooms across the uh, country, uh, in, in uh, newsrooms across the country. Um, a couple announcements before I do uh, the introductions to our first folks. Um, first off, if anyone is going to uh, workshop 1A this afternoon, you can go ahead and uh, take a look at this just really quick. Pull out the schedule. You should have gotten this when you registered. If you take a look uh, at workshop 1A, we only have 15 spots for that, and that's with Toshi Meida. So if you want to sign up, you have to sign up for that at the registration desk. Again, Wendy, I believe, should be there, so you can talk with her if you want that. Again, only 15 spots, so make sure you do that if you want to. Um, in addition, uh, we have a raffle going on, and you should have seen this online. Uh, a lot of gifts this year, a lot of raffle prizes this year. Uh, the most, uh, 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 the, the biggest thing is Cathay Pacific tickets, round trip tickets from Hong Kong to anywhere in Asia. And we have our AAJ member, Ellen Wong, over at Cathay Pacific. Where is she, if you could raise your hand? There she is, there's Ellen. Everyone, please say thank you with a round of applause to Ellen and Cathay Pacific uh, for doing that kind sponsorship. Uh, you guys did it last year as well, so thank you again for that. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, uh, four smartphones uh, to give away at the end of this conference. And we want to thank Richard Lai. Where's Richard? Uh, Richard, stand up. Uh, Richard Lai is chief editor of Engadget China, uh, and so he helped score that. Uh, we also have Cases of Wine, uh, an autographed book by AAJ member Cheryl Tan over New York uh, called Tiger in the Kitchen, as well as a DVD set uh, from Choreo Tours about uh, North Korea. Some really cool videos there, uh, really cool movies. Uh, all right, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, two very important people who without them None of this, AAJA and Hong Kong University, couldn't have happened uh, here in uh, Hong Kong and here in Asia. I'd like to uh, introduce Ying Chan as well as Alan Chung to both come up. Uh, Ying Chan is, uh, come on up, yeah, is director of uh, uh, Hong Kong University's Journalism School, Journalism and Media Studies Center. Uh, and she also helped found the Asia chapter. And Alan Chung, he is our Asia president based in Beijing, but comes back and forth between Beijing and Hong Kong too, so we see him a lot. He's also the China bureau chief for institutional investor, as well as Paul Chung, come on up. Uh, he's also our AJ national president uh, based over in New York. So uh, if I could have Ying give a couple first uh, comments. Uh, welcome everybody, it's great to see people here from uh, not only from Hong Kong but literally all over from DC, from New York um, and uh, to see new friends and uh, old acquaintances and uh, on behalf of Hong Kong University and the Journalism and Media Studies Center, welcome everybody. And um, and we, to say that it's a center is an, an understatement, I think, uh, because we're, we're a full-fledged uh, department. Uh, we offer degrees at various levels. You'll meet our, our wonderful, hardworking students and staff here. Um, it's a great uh, honor to partner with AAJA, my favorite organization. I was there where they, yay! <laughs> New Yorkers, who are anyone from New York? <laughs> yay! Uh, I was a founding member of the New York chapter in the 80s, where we met in a loft on the west side. And uh, so it was wonderful to work with uh, AJA here. So welcome again and enjoy the day. Okay. And well, Helen is also no friend. Thank you for that, Ying. 
Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, this is our 17th year as an Asia chapter. Uh, we were founded in 1996, and uh, back at that time, uh, it was a historic time. It was right before the Hong Kong return to Chinese rule, and a group of us, uh, chief among them, Alan Olta, who was based in uh, Tokyo at that time for the Oregonian, he and I brainstormed, and we thought we should put on an event to host other Asian American journalists who were coming out to cover the 97 handover. So that's how we started this. And we uh, put on this event at the Foreign Correspondence Club in Hong Kong. It was wildly successful. And uh, it was sponsored by Ying and Hong Kong Youth School as well back then. And, uh, in, and uh, the subchapter has gone from then. We put on dozens of events across the region over uh, the last 17 years, but none of them compared to last three years. Under Ramey Innocencio's leadership, this is our third year, third uh, uh, conference, and uh, we can see from all of you, it's uh, getting bigger and more successful. And I want to thank all of you for coming here, and uh, for Paul, our national uh, president especially, for coming out and uh, sharing us, uh, giving his time and his leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Yen. I just want to personally thank um, Hong Kong University for hosting this great event for the past three years. And I also want to um, give a mention to um, the Wall Street Journal, who is one of the co-sponsors um, for an event later tonight. Um, and the Asia chapter is the one that bring the big A to AAJA. <laughs> and so I highly encourage, this is one of the major events that we do in AAJA, and we have more than 21 chapters across the US and in Asia. And we host many different events from social media training to mini conferences and to our national conference. So I highly encourage everyone to join AAJA as a member. And contrary to people's belief, you don't have to be Asian to be an AAJA member. Or American. Or American. Um, you just have to believe in, you know, or journalists. <laughs> But, but you do have to believe in our mission, which is fair and accurate coverage for um, Asians and Asian Americans across the region, and also um, you know, to really help you know, diversity of voices within the newsroom. And diversity can mean a whole sorts of different things, from economic diversity to geographic diversity to ethnic diversity and racial diversity. So, so when think about diversity, try to really think about it in the broadest sense. And I also want to thank um, the Asia chapter, especially Ramey and Wendy, for putting on this great event. And I'm expecting a bigger one in years to come. <laughs> Challenge accepted. That'll happen. All right, so uh, a couple of things that I did forget before we go to our first uh, um, panel. Uh, one thing from last night. Who was, at the, um, who was at the social at Pier 7 last night? You can see those are the ones with the dark circles under their eyes, right? <laughs> Anyways, thank you all very much for coming. As you know, we did have a raffle for AAJA members, and uh, the raffle prize for that was this, uh, a Xiaomi phone, again, sponsored by Xiaomi from over in China. And we do have a winner, and I see him bumping his fists up in the air. John Noonan, can you come on down? So John is an AAJA member and professor from Shantou University, coming over with Ching Ching, and I know you wanted to say a couple words as well. Uh, Oh, okay, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much to AAJA, and I wanted to say a special hello and thank you uh, to an old friend and great lady in Hong Kong, Dean Ying Chan from the JMSC. Ying invited me almost 10 years ago now to work at Shanto University, and uh, it's been a wild, amazing ride. And uh, Ying, we love you and we miss you, and we're desperately trying to keep the good work that you started there going under increasingly different difficult circumstances. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. We appreciate you so much. And thank you for the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> All right. Now, if you would like to win one of those phones, we still have four more. And in order to do that, you have to enter a raffle. Now, you don't have to be an AAJA member. But if you do, we would love you even more. Um, so we have four people, at least four people, I think, floating around with raffle tickets. Uh, who are those? And raise your hands. So we have Elaine Ayo right there, Jun Chang, Hannah Bay, and Yuriko Nagano, um, all four of them. They are selling raffle tickets. And uh, this is the price breakdown. Uh, one ticket for 50 Hong Kong dollars. That's about six US. Uh, if you get five tickets, it's uh, 200 Hong Kong, so it's a little bit cheaper. 10 tickets, 
300, so it's a little bit cheaper there. You get where this is going, right? And then 20 tickets for 500 Hong Kong dollars. Uh, and again, the Cathay Pacific prize and the Xiaomi phones, they're worth much more their weight than in uh, just, uh, what, $500 or so. So definitely meet and look for these people all around. I'll be making this announcement over and over and over again. So uh, um, yeah, stay tuned. All right, so without further ado, I would like to have our first panel come on up. Uh, and as you guys come on up, I will do a couple introductions. This is uh, our panel on the China investigations. Oops, cracking the Middle Kingdom. So if I could ask Christy, uh, Ed, Neil, and Natasha to come on up. So, uh, if you've ever lived in China, you're uh, definitely well acquainted with uh, the term uh, meo banfa. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there is an open Wi-Fi code. If you link up to Hong Kong open Wi-Fi, it's free. Yeah, good question. So, who here knows the term meo banfa? Meo banfa. What does it mean? Just shout it out. <laughs> meo banfa. <laughs> Sorry, I don't speak Cantonese, but Mandarin. So meo banfa means there's no way, right? There's no way that you can do something. And these folks who have operated in China and who still do operate in China know that uh, you can still get around them because of their investigative reporting. So uh, first off, I want to just do a couple quick introductions. Although we don't really need too much of an introduction for most of these folks. Um, first off, Christy Lou Stout will be our moderator. She is a, a, an award-winning anchor and correspondent for CNN International, based right here in Hong Kong. Uh, she's the host of Newsstream, which you've probably seen uh, once one of these uh, weeknights. And she's also uh, the anchor for a new monthly show on China, which just started, what, two months ago, I want to say? One month? Yeah, no, it started in China, but it's Shabada. We didn't start in China. Oh, okay. Yeah, in, um, in the fall of 2020. All right. It comes in February. Yes. And then also we have uh, Natasha Khan from Bloomberg. Uh, Natasha joined Bloomberg in 2011 as a reporter covering regional health and science. Uh, she was part of a team of Bloomberg news reporters that produced a Revolution to Riches, an award-winning uh, investigative series that uncovered the financial holdings of China's ruling class. We also have Neil Western coming from Bloomberg. However, Neil, we didn't get a picture from you. And there was an egg on your Twitter account, but I didn't want to put you as an egg. So I hope you don't mind, I don't have your picture. And then we also have Edward Wong from the New York Times coming down from Beijing. Uh, he's been in Beijing since 2008, where he's covered all things China. Before that, he was working for the Times for 13 years total. Uh, his first foreign assignment was in Baghdad, Iraq, where he covered the Iraq War. Uh, Edward first went to China in 1996. And I just have to give a shout out to a, a Virginia friend, because I'm also from Virginia, just like Ed, just from Northern Virginia. Yeah, same hometown, Alexandria, Virginia. Sh shout out there. <laughs> and Hannah Bay is also from Northern Virginia. All right, so with that, I'm just going to hand it over. Chrissy, please. All right, Ramey, thank you so much. Now, for the panelists, very nice meeting you this morning to see the faces behind the bylines. I've admired your work for a while now. I think we need to switch on our microphones. I just switched mine on from off to on. We are fully on. Now, it has been an incredible year, both as journalists watching China, um, journalists inside China, um, and just as media junkies in general, looking at the investigative reports coming out of the country, especially in regards to the money trail, the alleged wealth stories that um, earned um, well-deserved prizes for both the New York Times and Bloomberg. Just quickly, a signpost of what's going to happen ahead in this conversation this morning. First, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of investigative reporting in China, right? How do you dig up a story? How do you cultivate your sources, et cetera? Then we're gonna go into the risks involved, the working conditions for both foreign correspondents and also the Chinese news assistants as well. That's an issue that we should also touch on. Lastly, um, the future of investigative reporting in China. If, if last year the blockbuster story was about the money trail, was about alleged corruption and wealth, what are journalists gonna be digging into this year? What is gonna be the hot story this year? Um, and then at about 10, let me look at my clock, 10.20 a.m., that's when I'm going to open up our discussion here to all of you, because I know we have some extremely, cu insanely curious individuals out there who have some questions they want to ask these panelists up here. So let's begin. Um, the first question, just want to ask you about your individual work. Um, you know, Neil, Natasha, and Edward, can you just go through one piece of investigative reporting that you did that you are particularly proud of? Share it with the audience. Um, thanks, Christy. Um, 
Uh, I guess the, the piece I'll talk about is the story we did um, last year on Xi Jinping, the, um, now the president of China. Um, you have to look at it in the context. About a year ago in China, things were in a state of flux. Um, uh, Bo Xilai had been ousted. There was talk about corruption. And there was also a lot broader talk in, in the previous years of rising inequality in China. Um, and you know that was a big concern for people in China. And you know a story that's not that easy to explain how it happens um, to the rest of the world. Um, so Bloomberg did started off by doing a story um, looking at some of the um, wealth that the Borgelai's family had, um, and they did that through corporate records uh, in Hong Kong. Um, we decided it, that it would be interesting to look at the people, not who'd just been removed from power, but those who are, who are currently in power or coming to power, um, and if we could find a paper trail that would lead us to that. Um, you know, it was a hunch, and you know, we, we started looking at several different people that we could possibly um, try and find a way into. There are rumors about certain um, Politburo members more than others. Um, but sometimes, because there are a lot of rumors, that meant information was very, very hard to find, hard to find leads beyond rumors, and sometimes the impression that things may be rather well, too well hidden to find. Um, but when it came, you know, we did suddenly develop some leads on the person we ended up writing the story about, and once we started to get into, um, you know, once we got that first break, then others started to come. I think that the hardest thing to do in these stories, and, and the same with the New York Times, I'm sure, for the Wen Jiabao story, was you've got to figure out who these people are, who their relatives are, who their contacts are. And whilst in most countries that would be quite easy, it's sometimes really hard to prove that someone is, even has a sister, who that sister is, um, let alone the, the in-laws, um, the brother-in-laws, son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, um, who, who are often key to trying to unlock the connections. Um, so, so we did that, and um, you know, it, uh, it, it was a pain. It was a very long process, very meticulous process. Um, but at the end, we came across well, with a lot of uh, uh, investments that were um, hidden, and you know, we, we brought them to public attention for, as a part to explain how China's system has worked in this huge period of, of, of wealth. Um, creation and how certain people have benefited and um, you know I think it uh, was part of a number of stories last year by us and others that really you know sh shone a light on how China is working now. Yeah and Natasha I know that you played a role of course in, in this coverage. Um, I want to follow up with what Neil said a question for you Natasha. Um, how do you separate fact from fiction and rumor from truth? How do you parse that as a journalist? Um, I think it, it has to do with a lot of really meticulous fact-checking, talking to everyone we can. And, um, you know, obviously our first duty is to be accurate, you know. And I think um, the, the series that we did, it took us nine months in total for, for everything. And it was really day and night, talking to really everyone we can, pursuing every um, lead that we, we came across. And when it came to... I mean, I think later on maybe we might touch upon social media. You know, sometimes you do have paragraphs there that you kind of say, "Hmm, I don't, I don't, I don't really think this sounds right." And it, it really is about, I guess, going back and talking to sources and talking to whoever we can to verify um, what we have. And and for us, um, a lot of our stories last year was on documents, and um, you know, and one of the reasons why I, I think it takes so much time and, and attention and you know a lot of concentration is to um, cross-check people, for example, their ID numbers. Um, uh, for example, Cantonese or Mandarin translations of their names. Um, you know, it really takes a lot of going through. And, and you know, when we do find two pieces of paper among thousands that really do um, link two people that seem to be unconnected together, it, it was you know a triumph, a little triumph. Yeah, very meticulous year. research, nine months in the making. You're right. We will touch on social media as a tool and how to carefully use that. Mm -hmm. Before we go to that. Edward, want to get your thoughts on work that you did that you're particularly proud of? Sure. Um, <clears throat> in uh, I think the very first sort of investigative um, line of reporting that every reporter in China engaged in last year was the Bo Xilai story. Yeah. 
And um, when that broke, uh, the first Western organizations to sort of break mention of the murder as connected to Wall Street Live were Reuters and the Wall Street Journal. And then that sent every all the other reporters in Beijing into scramble to sort of um, look at Bo, his family, and his connections. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to find out more about his life in Chongqing and find out sort of what kind of mini empire he had built out there. And we first got a tip to it because our bureau received an electronic audio recording from someone um, through a certain you know channel. And it was people who ha- were in, who had ties and associated with Bo's inner circle in Chongqing talking among themselves in a room. And in this recording, they were talking about sort of people they knew, sort of talking a little bit about the history of how Bo had set up his connections in Chongqing. So then um, I decided to fly out to Chongqing, made some contacts out there. And through that reporting and then through following that up with a look at some records, especially the co- through the company reg- registry here in Hong Kong, then we pieced together a picture of um, Bo, his ties to a billionaire named Xu Ming, um, who was, you know, Forbes had said he's one of the 10 richest people in China, I think back in um, the late 2000s. And then also, um, and then also like some shadowy people that Ball was associated with, like a fixer that he had named uh, Yang Saixin, who was a, a military intelligence guy who Ball brought over to Chongqing to help starting, to start setting up connections there. And, you know, you hear like um, Natasha and Neil were just saying, you hear a lot of rumors when you're reporting out these stories. And then the key is, to cross-check them with other sources, but also to use both um, public records as well as open source um, material. You can actually find a lot of material in, in government websites in China, in um, state media reports. And like some of these names that we came across, like this guy Yang Saixin, had never been mentioned by anyone in connection to the Ball family before. But then when we first um, heard about him through a source in Chongqing, then I looked up, you look up his name, and he's actually has appeared in one or two uh, media stories that the Chinese media had reported. It wasn't about Bo. It was a strange story in Chongqing about how he had two uh, mastiffs or large dogs that had killed a man. And then, um, and so it's like uh, you get these interesting tidbits and they sort of help flesh out a picture. And then you can write a narrative story about sort of this inner circle with details and with color. And I think that, um, you know, that's the type of story you're aiming for is you're aiming to build a narrative of, um, of how this person got to this place, in this case, the Bois family, or sort of the life they built for themselves, um, you know, using their wealth and their connections. I have a very mechanical question. Again, we're talking about the nuts and bolts of investigative reporting. As you're dealing with so many sources, so many interviews, so many original documents, how important is it, how not important is it to know and be able to read Mandarin Chinese? I'll go first because I don't read. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had a large team. We had reporters in um, China, um, in Hong Kong, and in the US. And the reporter in the US used to work in Beijing. Um, but the reporters all read and and can speak Mandarin Chinese. I was an editor, so a, a different process. So um, it's absolutely invaluable, both to have reporters um, and assistants in China who can help, and also people like Natasha, who's trilingual here in Hong Kong. and actually did a phenomenal job of organizing our many, many bundle files of documents. Mm. Edward, I know you took a sabbatical to, to brush up on your Mandarin Chinese before being posted to Beijing. Right. I think that the um, in terms of looking at documents, uh, for I think if you're one of the lead reporters on one of these stories, it's actually is, is a hugely time-consuming to do that. So a lot of times we would get these documents but then ask our researchers to pour through them. Um, it would just take too much time, and what we did was we uh, we spent time meeting sources and talking to sources. So, and I think that t- in that p- that part, it's important to a degree to know Mandarin because a lot of times on this type of story, you don't want to bring a translator yeah. with you. You might just want to meet a person, and then they don't necessarily. Um, if you have are starting to build a relationship with them, it's a little awkward if you have like a third person who's there, um, who's also hearing all the stuff. So sometimes um, to a degree. It's helpful to have enough Mandarin where you can have a conversation, um, or at least have a conversation that you can record and get other things translated. But I do know that, I mean, my colleague David, he doesn't, he's not fluent in Mandarin and he doesn't read Mandarin, and he did, um, you know, the best China story that the Times produced this year, so it's not necessary either. You know, it, it is in the pursuit of journalism, reporting in motion. 
but it's also an exercise in project management too, right? You were talking about your role as a lead reporter, right. having Chinese news assistants. How do you divvy up the roles, as it were? Um, yeah, as I said, we had a large team, so you know, we 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 shared. We had a place where we could share all the documents securely that we were using across borders, and um, and had message groups that everyone was in the loop. So. <laughs> Um, kind of at the start, we didn't know how difficult and how you know <laughs> how sprawling it would be. So the, the management system kind of evolved as we went, and the, you know by the end you were like, if we'd actually worked some of this out earlier, <laughs> we'd make, you know may have made things easier. Um, but certainly everyone has different skills. I mean, Ed talks. You know, we have reporters in Beijing who cover politics, and you know they go out very well and meet sources. Um, uh, and then we have others who are um, particularly good at you know really digging through documents, searching to make connections on, on, on the web. And, you know, there is a lot on the web, but it's not, it's not that easy to find unless you're really savvy at, at, at the searching it. Um, and then maybe Natasha could talk a bit about, you know, the role she played. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I definitely think, um, as we mentioned project management, and it, it really was, I think, after the Boshilai story and when we were doing the Xi Jinping story, we really realized that we had to have a better system. <laughs> so, you know, spreadsheets were actually very helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I guess no one goes into journalism thinking, oh, we're going to, but actually spreadsheets were <laughs> incredible for this. And it was also very exciting when you, when, you know, when you actually do a search on a spreadsheet and you find a connect, for, for example, an address or a phone number or a shared family name, you know, that, that was also very helpful because you, you have your own, I guess, resource to mine for, for uh, all these stories, especially, I guess, for the last story we did, which is on um, mapping the, the fortunes of the eight immortals and, you know, a hundred of their descendants, that's when it really became really invaluable because, you know, it's a hundred people and we probably looked at five times that, you know, in terms of people they work with and, and, and such. So that, that was important to be able to have something that all of us could could contribute to and build and then use as a resource. Yeah, S Spreadsheets, uh, an interesting <laughs> tool for journalism. Um, sources, how do you identify a source? How do you m make that first contact with the source and cultivate a relationship with the source? How does that work? Um, I think a lot of it starts from people you already know, like uh, being based in Beijing, you meet a lot of people who are involved in uh, politics, who are involved in the system, so to speak. Um, I don't, I mean, I can't say that I, um, sort of have lunch regularly with like a great government source, but I do have lunch with um, like lots of people who are within the system, for lack of a better term. And then they um, they will point you to other people whom they know, and especially when you have to go to other cities for reporting, like when you go out to Chongqing, then they'll say, "Oh, you should look up this person." Um, and having you know them uh, be able to invoke their name, like a name of a friend, helps open doors. Uh, also, I think another thing to look at is there are a lot of um, Chinese who work within the system who um, want to divulge information to people to get it out. And these will include, for example, Chinese journalists and academics. And I think those are people that um, any reporter working in China should stay in touch with. I'll, I'll add, uh, Ed, that I, I think also for these investigative stories that we've done, it was really about leaving no stone unturned. So uh, a lot of times while we were following the money trail, you come across so many names, so many addresses. And, you know, last year a lot of time was devoted to knocking on doors. You know, I've been <laughs> to a lot of different um, people's apartments and houses. No, literally knocking, knocking on doors. Really knocking on doors. Hi, we're doing the story. We found your name on this. How do you know this person? Can you tell us what you know? And, you know... Sometimes it, it, you know, you get nobody opens the door. Or they'll say they'll speak through the door to you. But sometimes we we did get lucky in some cases. So, and after we do talk to that person, and we, I guess, meet them again and try to build their trust, which is I guess the most important thing about cultivating sources. Interesting. Now um, let's talk about social media because that's turned into an alternative virtual way of sniffing out a story or even cultivating sources that way. Um, what social media tools do you use, and do you have any rules of the road when using social media as investigative reporters? Um, Weibo obviously is really important because so many people are on it, and um, at the same time, I I was gonna when I was thinking about what to say at this panel, I think there's also um, unexpected sources of 
internet media, I don't, I don't know if it's social media, but you know, for example, job ads. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk to the, the companies that we're following, they'll be HR people or someone, you know, the VP that used to be there that has still his cell phone would work, you know. Um, that was that was really invaluable. LinkedIn, again, when we're looking at companies, is important because, I mean, some of the LinkedIn profiles that we looked at might be a few years old, but we'll know that that person worked at the company when one of our characters was working there. And again, that was a really important source of finding people to talk to. And I would say that in terms of so monitoring Weibo, I mean, Weibo has really changed the landscape of reporting in Beijing probably more than anything else in the last 10 years. Um, and the not only is it useful for keeping track of new, like running news, like, you know, if a train crash happens and what people are saying, and, um, but also uh, even for the stories that touch on politics on the very highest levels of politics, then things will filter out on Weibo. And if you're canny enough, you'll catch it. I mean, one thing that all of us missed, everyone in Beijing, was well before the Western press tied the murder of Haywood to um, Boa. Like, it was out on Weibo. Like, it appeared on Weibo in February when um, one uh, southern group journalist put out a Weibo message saying, oh, this um, Wang Lijun going to the Chengdu consulate is somehow related to the murder of Neil Haywood and the Boa family. And it was, it was a Weibo message that sat there for a while. And I mean, there's so many rumors out there, so it's hard to sort of pick it out. But if, you're, um, if your antenna is up, then you might be able to pick up something that then would lead to investigative story. None of the Western journalists who ended up starting to break that story had seen that wave ball message or acted on it. Like, they, they broke the story based on other means, but the wave ball message was out there. Um, we also found it quite good for building the narrative when we, when we did the Eight Immortals story. Um, uh, and we were looking for the subsequent generations, it got harder and harder to find, and there were lots of great-grandchildren we couldn't find. Um, but um, we had a break and discovered a Weibo camp belonging to the great-granddaughter of Wang Jun, who was one of the founding fathers, um, big figure at uh, Polly and Sitik. And she had an amazingly transparent life <laughs> that she loved to write about herself every day and her lifestyle, the business class lounges, and you could follow her life. Um, and she'd post pictures of her great-grandfather, of her uncle, so it also helped confirm a lot of the relationships um, just through that, but also if you were able to really see someone's life in real time. It was kind of scary to, <laughs> to watch. Yeah. But when do you decide to make that jump, when you see something akin to Wang Lijun being in the U.S. consulate in Chengdu, and, or, 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 or see sort of the buzz and say, do you know what, I think there's something here. Do you rely on instinct or I mean, when do you decide, I'm going to devote some muscle and some effort and some time into this to find out if this is true or not? I think partly it's, um, I mean, a small part of it is an instinct, but then there's so many things out there, it's really hard to, I think even some of the best rep reportorial instincts would be, might be a little confused if they try to figure out cold what to pursue. But I think that that's, this is where your sources come in, where people you keep in touch with who know something about the system say, oh, I think that I saw this message. And a lot of times, like, the most interesting Weibo messages are ones that, I mean, I'm not sitting there monitoring Weibo, like, constantly, but it's someone, like, a friend might say, oh, did you catch this? Like, you should take a look at this. And then um, I think that's when you decide whether or not to start pursuing something. And Edward, it was interesting hearing you say uh, Weibo is being such a game changer in the last 10 years of, of reporting in China, just a real game changer in the craft. Um, there's been so much buzz recently about WeChat, and you made the quick reference to the Wenzhou train collision that was considered you know, widely as the watershed moment, especially in terms of breaking news on Weibo. Will there be a watershed moment in terms of breaking news on WeChat? Do you, in, do you use WeChat? Do you envision that as being a tool for investigative reporting? Uh, yeah, I do use Weixin. I haven't used it in reporting yet. Um, so I'd be curious, like if other people at this conference have you know, used it before, I'd be curious to hear yeah. how they use it. Um, the, I'm not sure that it would, it hasn't gotten, in terms of um, the news value traction in China, it hasn't gotten the same um, following yet as Weibo in terms of discussion of social issues and then um, and then breaking news. It hasn't gotten to that degree yet. Although I could see, you can, I think you can send photos, for example, of events more quickly over wasting it can be transmitted more quickly. So I could see how visual, like it could um, offer visual documentation quicker than Weibo. Now in, in all your investigative reporting work, do you, is there ever the question in the back of your mind, this could be a state secret or 
what's going to be the fallout from this? Now we're going to get into the second phase of the discussion, which is about the risks of doing this type of work in China. Um, always, and you know, I'm, I'm not aware. Um, you know, state secret can be defined at any time. I think and, and made retroactive. Um, I think th what's important to do is to um, report transparently. Um, honestly, you know, in good faith, you're looking for information, you go about it in the correct way, you're not doing anything underhand. Um, so, you know, if, if there comes a time where somebody has a problem with what your tr information you're trying to get, you have a perfectly clear conscience in saying this was a public document, you know, this was a public company record, or this was, you know, <coughs> you know we got this from this government website. As, as Ed said, there's a huge amount of detail on some of, some of those websites. Um, or, or you know, official news coverage of funerals, weddings. I know David talks about going to um, graveyards to, to find leads for the for the Wen story. Um, it's you know, but e everything there's, there's nothing underhand. It's up front, and you know, when you have your story, you go and ask for a comment openly. I, I think that's the best way to deal with it. Um, I would add that we uh, talking about going back to them for comments. You know, uh, last year we really made every effort we could to reach everybody that we wrote about um, for a comment. You know, including for example FedExing things to the address. You know, if we couldn't reach to my phone, there was no other door. We, you know, send FedExes or you know, we, again knock on doors. We just made a lot of effort, and I think that also made made everything more transparent. Right, and I agree that um, the state secrets thing is a very flexible term, and uh, and I don't. So I think to a degree you can't. If you were to keep that fear in your mind all the time, you wouldn't be able to operate in China because any a lot of things you lay your hands on can be construed as state secrets. And we've seen a lot of um, overseas Chinese put into jail, you know, on charges of state having state secrets, even though they were just looking up financial records or um, even public financial records like. Uh, these guys are pointing out can be construed as state secrets. So, um, so it's something that we keep in mind, but it's also it would be um, too much of a hindrance if we thought if we dwell too much on it because of the flexible definition. And I have to say, like one thing that I've has concerned me recently isn't just the fact that uh, I mean, obviously it's much more egregious in China, but then in the U.S. you also see the Obama administration starting to use some of the same type of strategy in terms of the way they classify information and then going after journalists for trying to get classified information, like in the case of this recent Fox News reporter. So it's happening in governments around the world. But more in the working conditions, as you mentioned, journalists in China, in, in covering the story um, and covering uh, sensitive topics, have been detained. We have seen journalists um, expelled, or Melissa K. Chang, um, the expulsion of her, the Al Jazeera correspondent in Beijing. Um, visas withheld. Um, your thoughts on the working conditions for foreign correspondents in China the last 12 months and your personal experience working as a journalist in China? Um, it, it has gotten tighter for journalists. Uh, I'll have to say, in the New York Times experience, um, they've have taken retribution against us as they have with Bloomberg for the Wen Jiabao stories. Uh, one thing they did, did not do um, was expel uh, David Barboza, who did the reporting on the story. And people have been surprised about that. Ching Ching was just asking me why he wasn't expelled. And I think that um, they were canny enough to calibrate their reaction so that they wouldn't make a journalistic martyr out of him. And then that, if and also if they did take that action, they would make the Wen family look even worse than they already did. So then um, what they've done is they've uh, held up visas of reporters who are supposed to be working in bureaus. So we've had reporters leave Beijing as they would naturally do after rotating out, but our bureaus at, you know, not at full strength right now because reporters who are supposed to come in can't get their um, visas to work there. Uh, and also they've blocked their websites. So um, I know in David's case, they've stepped up monitoring or surveillance of both what he does and what his researcher does. So he's um, being a little bit more careful right now about what kinds of stories he's going after. And I think he'll ha he's going to see where this leads in the next few months. Bloomberg has suffered retribution as well. Um, th yeah, I mean, there were obviously reactions to what we did. Um, and, and, you know, we've had to try and deal with those as best we can as a company. But, I mean, from my point of view, always concerned about the, the journalists uh, most. And, um, 
Uh, it's right. I mean, it's not just us, but all foreign media organizations have had big problems getting visas um, in recent months. Um, last year was obviously a transition year, so there was kind of all kinds of factional rumors. Everyone was more jumpy than perhaps usual. Um, now we have a, a, a government firmly set un under Xi's leadership. You know, it will be interesting to see how that affects the policy, whether they're prepared to, to, to relax a little bit. Um, you know, certainly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, has communicated its message that, you know, it, it, it expects uh, journalists to mm -hmm. behave when, th when they are in the country. In terms of retribution, Bloomberg data terminal sales have been affected in China? I can't talk about the business side, <laughs> I don't know, but certainly the website was, was taken down as, as with the New York Times and, 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 and that was blocked, but um, I can't talk about the business side. Okay, let's talk about the hacking. Because um, a number of, of uh, journalist email accounts have been hacked in China. Um, whether or not your individual accounts have been hacked or colleagues, how do you protect your account while working on a story? How do you protect yourself digitally? Well, that's probably not something we should talk about in a public forum. Um, <laughs> but Fair enough. And I know it's uh, being live streamed and recorded. So, um, But I'll say that you know people usually uh, say if you're using Gmail these days, you should take two-step verification. Like that's it. Mm -hmm easy initial step to take, but then there's other various other things to do. And, you know, p uh, some people have started using tools like Silent Circle um, or other programs like that. Uh, the, um, in terms of the emails being hacked, that's not a new thing. Like, uh, that's been going on for years. And I think there's a conflation of, like, uh, there's been a conflation in people's minds in the last few months of simple hacking of an email account versus hacking an entire network, like a company's network, which is what's happened in the cases of many news organizations, or not many, but several news organizations this last year. So I would say the big difference that's happened this year or late last year was the hacking of networks and the infiltration of entire networks and um, by hackers who are allegedly based in China. Um, hacking of individual emails has been going on for quite some time. Um. Yeah, I do echo uh, everything that uh, Ed says. I mean, to some extent, you're operating in China. You, there's, there's a certain level of scrutiny, and there's no way you're going to get away from it. So, you know, you can take all the necessary precautions you can think of. But again, it goes back to if you're, you know, if you're doing everything in, in a straightforward way, um, it, you know, you're not leaving yourself open to anything other than the fact that some people may know what you're, you know, what you're actually trying to report on. Yeah, and sometimes that scrutiny can turn into harassment. It could turn into uh, police calls, home visits. Um, I know of uh, one correspondent whose 10-year-old son was visited by uh, police when, when he was away. Um, have you had any such experience like this? Um, luckily, I'm in Hong Kong, so, so I haven't, and Natasha as well. So unfortunately, our Chinese colleagues aren't here. Um, none, none, nothing like that. That, that you've described that, that I can talk about today. But the, uh, I think it was made public that one of your reporters in Beijing did get sort of threats, like physical threats. Is that right? I mean, it was out on well, Twitter. There's two kinds of reaction. One is, you know, there's the official reaction, which can be fairly, you know, there's the, the top level official, right. there's the, the, in, the, the people who um, implement that for the state, and then, the, but there are also other communication channels which can be used. Um, um, and you know you can interpret, you know, the uh, how strong those threats are accordingly. But and I, I don't think that's particularly necessarily any different in China as to anywhere else. If you're writing about certain families, they may have connections who, who you know, try to undermine maybe what your your reporting is. Um, in terms of police visits, um, I don't think I don't recall any time this year or late last year when there was a huge step up in police visits to reporters, but. There was, like, right around the time when there was this phantom, fears of this jasmine revolution taking place in China, uh, there was a uh, one-week period when um, almost every foreign reporter for a major news organization in Beijing got a visit or a call from the poli from their local police station, which is very surprising. It never happened. For many news reports, it never happened in their careers in Beijing before. People showed up at their doors, knocked on the doors, and said, we need to sit down and talk with you, and just... And, they're, and they were just saying, oh, we want to make sure that you're not like contributing to some sort of uh, you know, public unrest or anything like that. So uh, there was a real fear by the government at that time that um, Western journalism would help 
um, contribute to sort of like a maybe perhaps a 1989 style um, round of protests. Yeah, and the risks are even greater for Chinese nationals and Chinese news assistants um, doing investigative report inside China. I mean, as a foreign correspondent, you could be thrown out of China. Your Chinese news assistant can be thrown into jail, um, his or her family bullied, um, or, or worse. How do you protect your Chinese colleagues? Uh, and it's happened to the times before, as you know, like we had an assistant who spent three years in jail. Um, the, I, that's, it's a very difficult question. And I know it's something that both our Beijing and Shanghai bureaus have thought about. Partly it's um, if there's something very, very sensitive, you have to think about whether you want to work with this person on that. If it's a particular interview or if it's looking at a particular set of documents, do you want this person doing that? But um, I think in the investigative reporting you've seen recently, a lot of it is based on public documents. And in that case, um, there's a line of defense that you can use in terms of even if your researcher is translating the documents, then these documents are obtained in a very um, open manner or they're obtained in a manner that anyone in the public can use or they're taken off websites. So I think then you have a certain, um, there's a certain defensibility uh, in a case like that. Um, indeed, I mean, it's something we have a lot of uh, talks about. It's something that does worry you. You're right, Chinese nationals are much more at the sharp end. Um, the retribution can be much greater. Um, so we, you know, as an editor, my job would be to make sure that they don't do anything that would be seen not to be or be, you know, beyond the assistance that they're supposed to give. But, you know, in terms, you know, this were, these were heavily documented stories we we're talking about last year. So, you know, that was pretty clearly, um, you know, within the confines of an assistance role. We wouldn't have them going out knocking on doors, um, you know, trying to talk to anybody sensitive, any sensitive sources, um, because that would be you know, crossing, crossing a line. So it's very much up to us um, to make sure they're not in harm's way. But again, it's, a, you know, it's, it's very fluid in China. You never know where the line is and, and, and how, what, what kind of, how it will be perceived anyway. So, um, so we just, all we can do is do the, the best we can to protect them. Now, I, I notice on the clock we have just five minutes until we open up our discussion to the audience here. So um, my last question to the three of you here before we open it up is just looking forward. Um, what do you think is going to be the piece of great investigative journalism for 2013? What is the type of story that you would like to see your colleagues or your cohorts really dig into this year? I want to know what you're writing first, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, the, uh, I would say two things. One is I think we've already seen certain, seeing certain lines of reporting emerge, like you'll have noticed that the Times has written a lot on hacking, for example. But what's interesting is that Bloomberg was ahead of the um, curve on that because I think last year Bloomberg had actually some very good long-form investigative stories on hacking. Then it became a much hotter issue starting this winter because for various reasons. Um, including the fact that the Obama administration is making it to a top policy issue. But so you're seeing a lot of focus, not only from us, obviously, but from Bloomberg and from other organizations on sort of um, cyber activities by the Chinese. I don't know whether, you know, how far people will carry that line of reporting in the next half year, but so far for the first half of this year, it's been a big line of reporting. Um, obviously, there are lots of other there are lots of economic stories to be done. I think that's especially at Bloomberg has excelled at. Um, and, uh, and then I would say that one thing that um, I would like to see more of in general is to see reporters get out of Beijing more because I feel like with this last round of political, like last year, it was a heavy politics year and it was a, um, and there was also this thing about chasing financial records. Um, and I think that kept a lot of reporters in Beijing and a lot of us focused on leadership and people based in Beijing. But it'd be good to sort of get back out into the provinces and find out what's going on on, uh, you know, on a provincial level in China. Because um, if, you know, dep the viability of the system depends a lot on what's going on outside of Beijing. Um, I would definitely agree with that. And, you know, last year looking at so many things, we had so many leads that we would want to pursue, and that includes, I guess, the rise of power of officials across the country, and it's not just in Beijing or Shanghai, and I think that is definitely instrumental um, to have more stories of that to show everybody, you know, tell the best China story that 
there can be talks. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's only, I think, um, less than 700 foreign correspondents in China. So, you know, there are so many untold stories. So hopefully we'll be surprised by some stuff that comes out. Um, like Ed, I agree. I mean, there's so many other issues. So wealth and power is one of them. Um, but, you know, there are a whole interest issues that affect people every day. Um, education, the environment. Ed has to live through the smog in Beijing. And that's been quite a big story in, in the first half of the year. Um, you know, and again, what, what's being done to actually address those problems now that there is a new government in place, I think will be, you know, an analyzing how the new government lives up to its promises yeah, should, Neil, should be a priority. Neil, you're the investigative editor at Bloomberg. I mean, you must have a file of stories that you want to see covered. Uh, for example, Bushy lying. How is that going to continue later this year? What kind of questions do you want answered on that? Um, None, really. Um, I mean, t t to me, I mean, the Borsi Lai story is playing out. That's not something that my team would probably want to do. I mean, we, you know, we looked at it at the time. The New York Times Wall Street Journal did great, great stuff last year on Bor as well. Um, you know, there may be interesting twists and turns. There could be some unexpected developments. Um, you know, you read a whole lot of rumors about it, but I'm, I'm not really sure how, how accurate they are. Um, you know, I would prefer to, to move on to other kind of agenda areas than, than that one. And what about the Chinese economic story? Creative accounting with GDP figures, etc. Um, yeah, I mean, we've done a fair bit. We did quite a lot on the um, the US listed companies two or three years ago. June Lawrence, who worked on the wealth stories, used to live in Beijing. She she was did, um, instrumental in those stories. Um, you know, we have looked at leak economic statistics before. Um, so you know, there's the, there is always something there. And I think if you actually highlight something, you, government sometimes will actually, you know take heed of what's in the foreign media and, and those messages will be addressed, those concerns. Um, economic story, it's changing. Um, it's good, you know, there may, you know, th we've written stories about the shadow banking that could, uh, that could again erupt. Um, but it's, um, it, you know, th there's nothing particularly there that I'd say that we're on the cusp of breaking something. I have a, I have a something. juicy story in the works and you're not giving it up. You're not giving it up just I'm yet. hiding the fact that I don't. Yeah. Okay. All right, now's the perfect time to open up the, our, our discussion to the audience. All right, question right in front here. Um, so my question is, is there a perception that foreign media um, have usually cover China in a negative way or most of the story is really deal with the negative and not the positive? And the second follow-up question is, um, do you think it's easier, you know, aside from US media, what, what other foreign media uh, do you really expect this kind of coverage? You know, what about, um, oh, sorry, what about AFP? or um, medias in South Korea and, and, and Japan and so what do you guys use in terms of you know beyond the US centric uh, well in terms of I mean it's a question we get asked a lot is like is and um, is the US uh, media coverage or Western media coverage of China does it skew too much towards the negative and I'd say that I mean my answer to that is always that um, the role of the media like it's hard for me to imagine sort of what's you know, how you balance negative stories versus positive stories. Because um, the way the way I see the role of the media, I think the way a lot of journalists see it, is that it's sort of like a um, check on authority and power. So the role of the media is sometimes to portray sort of like everyday life, but, the, but with the power that the media has. And, you know, the reason why it's given uh, the sort of protected by the Constitution, at least in the U.S., is that it is supposed to be the fourth estate. It's supposed to document how power is used. And I think that when you're doing that in uh, other countries, then it might look like you're sort of uh, writing bias stories against those countries. But in fact, you're exercising um, the authority and the responsibility that you have as a media organization. And, um, and you know, when I was in Iraq, I got, uh, I and other Times reporters, we got heavily criticized by the, Bush administration and by the U.S. military for our coverage of the Iraq War, and um, and we got the exact same questions from uh, right-wing Americans and from uh, people of the administration: is, "Oh, why aren't you covering the positive sides of the war?" And the fact is that we weren't there to write about you know a school that soldiers have renovated. We were there to write about how the U.S. was exercising its power overall, the bigger picture in Iraq and where that war was leading the nation. Yeah, um, I'll add to that and say I think so much of the work we do is about 
shining light in di dark corners, you know, and I, I think that that really, you know, for example, after our stories were published last year, we did get s uh, some reader feedback, a lot from Chinese people who, who came and said, you know, thank you so much for, for doing this because we couldn't, we, we didn't know about this and it's important that we do. And I think that to, to, to me is what drives me to, to do this work and try to do the best we can for, for future stories. Yeah, just just finally. I mean, I think you know we're always accused of negativity anywhere in the world, as as, as Ed uh, highlighted. Um, but I do think it's important to always take a balanced view and to make sure you're not overlooking some of the positives. I mean, when we wrote about wealth and power last year, you've got to remember that this wealth creation is in the context of, you know, perhaps the biggest uh, economic growth in the world ever, and you know, three or four hundred million people have been pulled out of poverty. A lot of people have moved into the middle class. You can't, you know, that of course there are going to be um, issues coming out of that growth, but you've got to remember both sides. Um, and you asked two questions. So your second question was about other great examples of investigative reporting in China done by non-American Western sources. And if I could add on to that, also Chinese sources as well. Um, it, let's talk about Southern Weekly. Um, uh, let, you know, let's talk about you know, Tsai Xing. Your thoughts about other great um, investigative reports that you've seen ch on China? Uh, well, I think that um, the most, for us, the most impressive investigative reporting coming out of China is Chinese, uh, not other foreign media outlets, but Chinese journalists. And um, Christy just mentioned uh, Tai Xin, Tai Jing, non, the Nanfang group, the Southern group. They all do uh, great investigative reporting. And um, for example, there was one report that I was reading recently in one of the Nanfang papers about in um, a project that was polluting the environment and then the government um, issued orders, I think it was a water pollution issue, issued orders for the company to stop, but then they kept doing it. Like they just blatantly ignored the orders and kept doing it. And that was a story that appeared in uh, maybe not Fang Zhou Mo. And so um, I think that these are the sources that we look to when we sort of want to see what Chinese investigative reporters are writing about. And if you're, and in a way it speaks to your first question because they're saying, oh, is Western coverage of China too negative? But then when you look at the most interesting and aggressive Chinese journalism that's out there, then they're actually uh, like ahead of us in terms of the type of reporting that they're doing um, and sort of the, the shadows that they're chasing after. Um, in terms of other foreign media, for example, I was recently reading a Der Spiegel report about how EADS, the American, I mean, the European um, defense contractor, arms maker, and airline maker had been hacked and had a lot of their secrets um, sort of downloaded uh, or uh, trade secrets, trade um, information. And so there are other uh, news organizations that are out there doing, um, you know, parallel, uh, taking on these big themes like. Um, you know, uh, money, uh, industrial espionage, they're taking these themes and examining them in the context of their own countries. Natasha, especially as you're a Chinese reader, uh, Nanfang Zhou Kan, Southern Weekend Group. Um, is this Southern Weekly or Southern Weekend? How do you say it in English? It's uh, the official English translation that they use is Southern Weekly, but Got it. Um, the more uh, accurate translation from Chinese would be Nanfang, it would be Weekend. It'd be Weekend, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got that clarified. Um, they're on your radar in a big way. Oh, definitely, and I, I think I have nothing but the highest respect for our Chinese uh, colleagues that work at those publications because, you know, I know that they're working under perhaps more stringent, more scrutiny, and I think it's very brave that the, the incredible work that they've done. Yeah. Okay, let's take another question. All right, in the back there. Yeah. With public interest in mind, do you resort to checkbook journalism in your investigative reporting? Uh, never. <laughs> right. I can say we've never done that either. Do you think it's important sometimes to do that? Like the MP's expenses scandal in the Daily Telegraph? So I'm not that familiar with the, sorry, with that with that scandal, but I mean I, I think it's very important not to do it. I mean, um, as I just said, you know, you have to be honest um, wherever you work in the world, but um, if you you know if you do anything that is crossing ethical and legal lines, you're exposing yourself to all, all kinds of problems and, and undermining the work that you're doing. Right, and part of um, I mean, there's some great journalism in China, but uh, some of it is tarred by the fact that Chinese journalists, for a lot of organizations, do take 
um, Hongbauer uh, payouts from different people. I think that um, le you know that along with the fact that it's controlled by propaganda apparatus sort of um, leads uh, people to think that all Chinese journalists are this way. So the point I'm trying to make is that once you start down that road, even if some journalists uh, do it, then it sort of um, kills the reputation of the entire industry and of uh, or um, of uh, big papers, big organizations in the industry. Okay, let's take another question. This side of the room. Um, you, yeah, go ahead. Um, both the New York Times and Bloomberg were promptly and you could say predictably blocked after their stories last year. Um, was that a difficult business decision to make for the organizations? Um, I'm interested to know how big your Chinese readership is. I know New York Times publishes in Chinese. And if you're looking to encourage a greater Chinese readership. Uh, that's right. We launched our, webs our Chinese website last summer, almost around a year ago. Um, and the traffic was growing tremendously, and then it fell sharply, as you can imagine, after the Black Amber website, along with ad revenues too. Um, so the it did um, the blocking of it did have a huge business impact. And right now we're starting to rebuild that readership. It's back up to the same numbers it was at when we first launched, is what I'm told. Um, so the uh, and whether you know the business decision. There, I know that there were people on the business side who discussed the fact that we were coming out with this leadership story. Um, and we had seen what happened to Bloomberg when their Xi Jinping story came out. Their website was blocked. So we knew that that was the likely um, cost that we would have to pay. But um, I think that it wasn't, as far as I can tell, that wasn't given very serious or very heavy consideration when they were trying to determine um, you know, when to run this story. Um, I mean, Bloomberg obviously has business interests in China. Um, one thing that's very important when you're reporting and doing these kind of stories is that we're firmly on the editorial side. Anything we do, you know, I, uh, any business question is not for me. I'm, a, you know, we're working on the story. Um, there are, <coughs> you know, questions um, that affect the business side versus the editorial are taken obviously at a much higher level, and that's where the discussions are. And it's not really healthy for us to consider the business sides. Um, we just focus on getting the story right making it accurate, somebody else makes a decision on, you know, when you run it, how to mitigate any consequences of that. Um, you know, um, we have very separate, <coughs> a big division between the two, and so, you know, I wouldn't be privy to um, how they've handled the, the business side. Um, we just you know, move on to the next story. Okay, let's take a question from this side of the room. Um, uh, the woman here in the striped shirt. Um, I want to ask about the citizen journalists that are kind of becoming more prevalent in China. Do you think they add to the investigative scene? And would you work with them and use this use them as a source? Um, yes, I mean, w when we do come across, um, basically any voice that we come across, I think we, we usually, if, if it's, it's related to a story that we're pursuing, we do contact them and I, I have actually talked to some citizen journalists that, that have been very helpful as you know sources of, for example giving context or information or leads for for their uh, pursuing could you give us a, a concrete detail if you, if you can um yeah I mean um, last year when we were looking at the issue of inequality there were um, a lot of reports I think coming out of Guangzhou um, and it was a, a citizen journalist and there were his details so it called up and sort of asked about his situation and he was talking about how I guess how he had been treated in Guangzhou I mean ultimately to we um, it, it served as a base for uh, for you know, I guess higher up documents that we looked at, for example, um, or officials that we contacted, but that was um okay. We'll take another question here in the front. Um, the gentleman, the suit and tie. Hi there. Um, do you appropriately attired for yeah. the AJAJSMC conference? Um, Thank you. Do you believe the investigations, both like the New York Times and Bloomberg, did were a surprise to the Chinese government? And I mean, for example, Natasha you did a lot of door knocking. Mm -hmm. So do you believe the Chinese government were on to what you were investigating? Um, well, I mean, ultimately before we published, we also went to, to them and, and asked them for comments. So they, they knew fully that we were what we were looking into. I mean, we wanted definitely to give them, 
you know, full disclosure what, and, and give them a chance to comment. Um, but yes, th there were moments, you know, for example, uh, when we were knocking on doors, I think one of the doors I knocked on, um, I was with my colleague, uh, Michael Forsyth, uh, who was in Beijing, and we were here. Um, and, you know, we just kept knocking, and it was 8.30 in the morning. I don't know why we decided to go so early. And so he's like, oh, I haven't woken up yet. What do you want? And we're like, oh, you know, we're, we're looking for, um, you know, I, I think it was one of the nieces of, of Xi Jinping that we're looking at, and he's like, I, I don't know if we were talking about, wait, she's not here, and, you know, kind of, and we just had this strange discussion through the door. <laughs> um, so after that, we were, we were also a bit, oh, no, you know, maybe we have um, alerted, alerted them of what happened, but, um, you know, so, so definitely, as we do more reporting, we are, I guess, more people know what we are looking to. I think you also have to define them. Um, it's not like a monolithic organization where, you know, somebody finds out something and shares it with the rest of the government. So, you know, it's quite possible some people know what you're doing, how efficiently that gets around, um, you know, and th there will be some kind of policy or response to it. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I agree. I think that um, probably the thing that works in our favor is that uh, the government isn't well coordinated, like diff different arms of government, even if a local police station knows that you're, you ended up in some neighborhood um, looking at someone's house, that like it probably just ends up in their files. It doesn't go anywhere beyond that local pie truce file. So, um, and it then for example, the bureaucracy. right, exactly. And then if you request um, records of a company, like through the SAIC filings in, they don't know why you're, they don't know that you're requesting those records because you're looking for this one per a particular individual who might have invested in the company um, or be listed as a shareholder. They just know you want the records of some company. and. You know, these records aren't ones that it's just journalists who are pursuing. There's tons of people every day asking for these records through lawyers in China because the reason why the Chinese government started opening up these records was because there was so much foreign investment coming into China, foreign capital, that, um, and that capital will only come into China if there's some transparency about the companies that, um, that foreigners want to invest in. So then they keep these records open, and then it's just, you know, part of this mass paperwork system. And... Um, and I'd say that, you know, when you read things about um, how parts of the U.S. government don't talk to each other, then you can see, oh, definitely in China, then that's happening also. Okay, let's go back to this side of the room. Miss. Oh, hi. Could I just ask a follow-up question on that? I don't work in Asia, um, but I wanted to ask about what rights you guys have uh, – to freedom of information from government records in China, if any, other than these corporate records? Um, there is unfortunately no Freedom of Information Act that uh, I'm aware of, but there is an amazing amount of stuff you can find. Um, and to be honest, a lot of it was a learning curve um, in the information that you can find, and um, you know, from beyond company documents, just to websites you can access to, to obtain details and confirm details about people. Um, you know, it, the Hong Kong company records was, was you know, a, a very good source as well. Um, but those you get a fairly limited amount of information, you know, documents you can get from China sometimes have, uh, have a lot more in. Um, it's, you know, Hong Kong is an in important place for reporting on China. And earlier this year, they did try to um, pass legislation that would have... Um, redacted some important details such as part of the identity card number and the addresses of people registered in businesses in Hong Kong and you could apply to have it um, previous records expunged. Thankfully there was a vigorous campaign um, by the FCC. Um, we all wrote stories about it and, th and that proposal was w has at least been kicked down the road for now. Um, so you know there are there, there are ways um, and you know, it's, it, you don't you don't necessarily need FOIA. That, you know, a lot of it is out there. You just got to find out where to look. Okay, here. Hi. Do you think there's an outsider's lens when it comes to coverage in China? Is there a gap between what the locals want to read and what you cater to an international audience? Is that the same? How do you like make that call? Uh, I think increasingly China China coverage is becoming more sophisticated because. Like I was saying how Weibo made this huge difference in terms of coverage. And obviously it doesn't represent the entire mindset of sort of the um, you know, people in China, but it does give, a, give us a good window into what people care about. And so you see a lot more stories now being motivated um, or the 
right the reason why the right reporter pursued that was because they saw that there's a huge conversation about it on Weibo. So, um, and so I think that uh, it's becoming more sophisticated. That there's no longer sort of like um, probably 10, 20 years ago, you'd see like stories about how weird China is. Like, oh, Chinese, there's a dog restaurant and whatever. But that type of story would be laughed at. Like someone who does that type of story would be considered sort of a complete amateur these days because it's um, no one, that doesn't fly anymore. Like um, the reason why, for example, the environmental story became so big this year was because of the fact that um, for many middle-class Chinese, it became like the central topic of conversation in large urban cities in um, eastern China and northern China especially. And so I think that the line of reporting that foreign media started picking up on that was and why they aggressively pursued that story was because of the conversation that was going on among Chinese. Um, same with issues like food safety, for example. That's a huge, that's like pollution and food safety are probably the two topics that Chinese would love to see more reporting on from anyone. Like they want more transparency on that. And so I feel like um, any reporting we do on it, just that really does a public service for people throughout China. Okay, we'll take another question on this side. Right over here. Okay, um, I um, have a question for Edward and Latasha because I mean, um, because both of you work for um, foreign, me foreign media, but all you but you all look Asian. So when you when when um, when you investigate in China, have you ever have you ever been treated differently um, from journalists having um, Western appearance? I mean, what I mean is what 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 I mean is let's say when 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 you go to Thailand, when you try to um, talk to um, an official, they he or she may be very may treat you very in a very barbaric way, but then they. But when, but when, when, he, when he, when he or she realizes that you are work for New York Times, you work for Bloomberg, then he or she, she or she certainly becomes very nice to you, treating you as the little uh, kings or queens. Got it. So, I mean, despite the <laughs> fact that you're foreign correspondents, being ethnically Chinese, does that work to your advantage or disadvantage? I, I guess I feel that. When I do, when I have been reporting, um, I, I kind of stick out <laughs> a little bit, um, um, and uh, I, I don't know that I've ever really had an experience where um, the attitudes changed once somebody knew where I was working. I, but usually, I, I would say, I mean, for me, I've always seen it as maybe when I say I'm a journalist um, and what what story I'm working on, you know, you'll you'll get an instant, oh, okay, you know, and then people will be more helpful or unhelpful sometimes. I don't react, I don't interact a lot with officials in my reporting, so I can't really speak to your question about, like, how officials perceive us. Um, the, I think being ethnic, uh, having, uh, you could be any ethni Asian ethnicity, but if you can pass as Chinese, it helps a lot in reporting on the mainland because you can just walk into places. No one, oh, the guard at the gate won't stop you. They'll think you were someone working that building or they'll think that you're um, visiting a friend or something. Like um, early example is like when we were doing some reporting on the uh, Sichuan earthquake and there were these refugee camps that had been set up. There were guards at the entrances to these camps. I wanted to go and just talk to people and you could go in, they wouldn't, the guard wouldn't, you wouldn't have to explain why, what you were doing there, like why you were there, that the fact that you worked for a newspaper. Um, I just did a story this week on um, hacking and there was this trade show for police equipment that you could go to and there were Westerners there but I think it helped most of the people there were Chinese and it helped to be able to hang out like in these booths that were where they were making these pitches for police equipment um, and just like listen to them people talk if they you were a Westerner who was like standing there sort of listening taking notes I think it would have been um, it, you would have stood out more so I think in terms of getting access it it helps a lot. I'd also like to take a question from the uh, woman in the black shirt here who also happens to be writing an article for the JMSC website on this panel discussion. So what question do you have? Yeah, uh, you've talked a lot about following the paper trail, but I'm interested in terms of sources and whistleblowers, have you seen a change in how willing they are to speak to you? Since when? Um, well, actually, I guess, yeah, since you've published these stories, have you seen any sort of increase in, in people who are willing to get in contact with you? 
Certainly at Bloomberg, I mean, this was quite a um, reporting we hadn't really done before. Um, so we did open up a lot of new sources originally, and it put our name out there for a lot of people who weren't really aware um, that we did that kind of reporting. So we certainly um, had a lot more people come and talk to us, whether that means there's an increase in people wanting to be whistleblowers, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I think it, uh, it's st still very difficult for someone to go out on a limb in China and to come along and say, hey, you know, I'm going to tell you all about something that's extremely sensitive or, you know, that could cause them some kind of uh, repercussions. Um, but, you know, Ed? And then I think the flip side of your question was then the sources that were approached for these stories, then do they like has have they sort of quieted down or and um and I think whenever one of these stories appears there is sort of like a slight a period afterwards when one the sorts might not want to um keep in touch with you immediately because they don't want um they assume that your the authorities might be tracking your monitoring your uh communications and they want to see who gave you this info but the other side is that you also don't want to keep in touch with these sort like I think there should be a chilling period um right afterwards because you should not, you know, um, try and hide your footsteps, not get them into trouble. And so you don't want to contact them immediately and stay in touch to the same degree that you were right before the story ran. So um, there's a cooling off period. Then I think that people get back in touch with each other again after that. Okay, we're in the final stretch now. If you have that epic question, sorry, Ying, you read, epic question from Ying, please. Well, I have a question for Ed. Uh, you have done a lot of reporting on Tibet. So what's the status of reporting there? Uh, well, Tibet's the one geographic area of China where it's illegal for foreign journalists to show up there unless you've been invited by the government on a government-sponsored tour. In my years, that's only happened one time. In my five years in Beijing, that's happened once. I went to Lhasa and a few areas around there as a result of that. But um, I think a French recently, I think if you go online, Fran France 24, I believe, did a video report from there. They were invited. Um, on a tour, but uh, you can access the Tibet story from uh, Qinghai and Sichuan. Uh, the thing is that there, um, people have, a lot of people who don't understand the geography of China think that Tibet's the, just the TAR, but um, you know, half, at least half the landmass of Tibet is outside of the, what are the borders of the TAR, and it's, there's no difference, other than there's some differences in some policies between the TAR and these other places, but in terms of the type elements you're looking for in story, you can get to all of them in Sichuan, Qinghai. Um, ever since the self-immolation started and since the 2008 uprising, there's been a tighter security in some of these towns, especially in the ones that are the epicenters of the self-immolations. But uh, I think you can still get to many, I mean, it's a huge, th huge plateau and you get still get to many places and talk to a lot of people there. Okay, um, one last question, stand up if you really think this is an awesome question. All right, Miss <laughs> Nevada. Thank you. Um, should I stand up or just sit up? <laughs> go ahead, go for it, go for it. <laughs> okay, um, because um, Chris Buckley in, that cl in our class has said he will pay more attention to the rural places in China because there will be more uh, stories there. So my first question is, do you agree with him? And uh, what kind of stories will your readers uh, be interested in countries out of China? And secondly, is uh, the second question is, what's the differences in the investi investi reporting in the countryside of China and the other areas of China, do you think? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the interest is huge. I mean, they're the real people of China. I mean, obviously, the urbanization, some people have moved into the cities, but um, out, it's still half of the country, or just under, lives out in, in rural areas. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of um, issues about health, education, um, their homes being taken, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get jobs. Um, just just getting on with their lives. So I think the interest is huge. Um, as I said, there aren't that many foreign correspondents in China, so there must be you know a ton of stories out there. Um, but the proliferation of journalists are in the big cities, and that's right. We, you know, people should get out more. It's just not always that easy because um, you know you need to have a foreign correspondent to be able to go out and do those stories, um, and there's limited manpower to to get out there. Right, and I know that some news bureaus in Beijing have talked about budget cutbacks from headquarters. So then I know that some journalists who would love to travel more 
aren't able to travel as much. Um, but yeah, I agree. And I think that these days, the rural story goes beyond sort of the traditional sort of story that foreign journalists would do, which is like, oh, there's some um, farmers in a town who are protesting because of a land grab or something. Um, because I think nowadays you can even do stories that are about sort of a large company and and what they're doing with that land or how they're how they're creating sort of like a shell shell game for the value of the company based on sort of land seizures um, in rural areas or or sort of these projects that they build that um, aren't there's no market for it but it sort of is built to increase say the stock value of the company and the wealth of the shareholders it's sort of like the type of point that Bloomberg was specializing so there's a lot of issues even the type of classic investigative reporting where you're looking at a corporation you can tie that into issues in the in the rural area I think that that's something that's important to do okay Edward Natasha yeah we're gonna have to leave it at that but thank you very much for an instructive conversation an intriguing conversation. The three of you do such important work. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for our three panelists. Thank you very much, everyone. And also for Christy for uh, moderating this terrific panel. Um, I'm going to ask you guys just to stay here while we make a few announcements. Um, so while this panel has been going on, many of you have already been tweeting. But if you are not, I just want to remind you that this is being live streamed. So it's important for not just the panelists, but for you to speak into the microphone because people uh, around the world, maybe even in China, have just been watching what you all have been saying. Um, so hopefully you guys get in afterwards. Um, so uh, the hashtag uh, is N3Con, if you don't know. Also, you can add on at AAJA. Asia, if you want to add both of those uh, as well. Um, also, if you don't have the Wi-Fi password, just click on HK Open Wi-Fi and just press accept. It's free. Uh, also, we are still selling raffle tickets, so please go around. We only have um, we only have 20 tickets, so you still have a high chance of winning, uh, maybe a lot of them. So make sure that uh, you get in the competition. Uh, also. Uh, you have heard some thunder happening outside, right? Uh, there is an amber rain warning, which means that uh, there's a potential for flash flooding. We're on the hill, so we probably aren't going to have any flooding here. More reason to stick around with us. Don't go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> before we go to a coffee break, I want to uh, look ahead to the next panel after the break, because we're going to split up. Uh, panel 2A, if you can take out your schedules, panel 2A will be right here. Uh, that will be moderated by Henry Williams. I believe Henry is outside right now with the panelists. Uh, but that's a data journalism in the era of big information. Uh, in addition, in Mengwa T3, which is past the coffee and past the muffins, that way, T3, uh, that is uh, connecting the dots from journalist to entrepreneur. And Professor Ying Chen will be moderating that as well. We start promptly at 11. Right now it's 10.45, so if you need coffee, you need to stretch, now's the time to do so. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>